Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. Is the Trump administration turning the U.S. military into a protection racket? Let's get to the bottom line. Burden sharing. Many American presidents have pushed this line, but Donald Trump has added a new dimension, arguing that allies of the United States have to pay more for, quote, protection. He has berated NATO allies, handed Angela Merkel a handwritten bill for $2 trillion on one occasion for money owed for Germany's protection, and moved on to Saudi Arabia. And last week, it was South Korea's turn. So what does it mean for the U.S. military forces spread all over the globe, and do America's allies smell a shakedown? Fortunately, we have three people in the room who have all the answers to these questions. Admiral William Fallon, who, was headed, who has headed both U.S. Central Command and Pacific Command and served as a presidential envoy to Japan. Lacey Healy, chief editor of Inkstick and host of a podcast on military affairs called Things That Go Boom. And Kevin Barron, executive director of Defense One, which covers U.S. defense and national security. Thank you all so much for joining us. Admiral Fallon, let me start with you. Burden sharing is not a new thing. Many presidents have been talking about it. I mean, I remember President President Obama, President Clinton, uh, both Presidents uh, Bush uh, actually talking to our allies uh, on numerous occasions and, and making the case that our allies uh, needed to do more. So what's different about this moment? Well, Steve, I think uh, before we get into this, it would be good to just keep in mind that uh, this is a complex uh, question, and the uh, arrangements that we have with different countries are almost all unique. So NATO, uh, the NATO alliance been around since uh, 1949, longstanding uh, tradition of security, uh, very, very helpful to us in the Cold War days. And uh, now it's, uh, it's a different era. But there are longstanding NATO agreements and arrangements that touch each well, of Well, of course, countries. NATO ally was very helpful to us after 9-11, too. It was Article M 5 M invoked, things. you know, and so. You go to other places in the world, and these are different. Uh, they're not the same. And so the arrangement we have with Korea is different than the one with NATO. And the arrangements in Japan are different, again, with Korea. And you go around the world, Singapore, uh, with uh, Qatar, uh, almost every place. These are not the same deals. And so to approach them as it's one thing, you pay or else, uh, is not, in my opinion, the right way to do this. And you have to keep in mind that uh, when these uh, agreements are negotiated... And you negotiated I've, a bunch of I've, them. I've done a number, yeah. uh, or been a part of those negotiations. They're best done, in my experience, offline, out of the limelight, uh, because some of the issues become very sensitive, and they're unique to the individual countries involved. Well, let's listen to President Trump for a moment uh, as he's talked about what he's trying to do on, on this front. We will insist on fair burden-sharing with our allies. I've made it clear, we are protecting many, many wealthy, wealthy, wealthy countries. We protect all of these wealthy countries, which I'm very honored to do. But many of them are so wealthy, they can easily pay us the cost of this protection. Kevin, the, the Admiral just laid out that, that many of these are different, that, that if you're, like, looking at Korea, that's a different deal than NATO. Uh, Qatar today, where Central Command has a huge uh, base in the yeah. Middle East. So is there a different... Are there some places where uh, burden sharing becomes protection, where essentially we're, we're loaning out our military muscle uh, for pay, running the, well, you know, running the Pentagon at a profit, if you will? Hey, look, it, it, yes, if that's what you listen to the president's word, but when you ask... But it doesn't, I mean, does, like, oh, wait a minute. The president, word, the president words, well, uh, you know, does it, matter, right? I say it depends, it depends yeah. how you look at this. Yeah. And then when you ask anyone in the military about why all of these agreements exist, it's because the United States has an enduring interest that these things exist. Mm. If, if you want a United States military that's able to react to a threat abroad or to act as a deterrent abroad, then the United States needs partners and allies. That's just basic 101 defense doctrine, right? Mm. So you need an agreement with, you know, to have basing. You need an agreement to have access to ports and overflights with all these individual countries. But I think we're already way down the weeds from what kind of real, what the, the bigger question here, which is Donald Trump has brought a new way of doing business, a new way of doing foreign policy, and he's done it by the will of the American people, or at least the Electoral College, uh, and a new era. 
And I think we're arguing a lot about the means, not the ends. Like you said in your opener, Obama and every other president and every other defense secretary and Joint Chiefs chairman before them uh, all had the same message to NATO. Please, you guys should pay a little more. You should meet your, your debts a little more. And right. even Democrats like Carl Levin were pressing so I, the Koreans I, I, I to do more. I get all that. I but just want to, I want to push you just an inch more before I get to Lacey and she's sure. going to you know, correct all of us on this. But I want to, <laughs> I, I want to ask you if—, if you ha set up the, the regime that our allies, that we have strategic interests in partnering with and deploying U.S. forces for, that we have someone out there that says we're not going to pay. Because paying for U.S. military bases and installations is sometimes a controversial thing in these countries. It's not, an easy, it's not an easy deal. Uh, and as the admiral said, most of these are dealt with without the, the spotlight on them, and they're done in closed rooms yeah. because it is domestically controversial. What else so what happens? But what happens yeah. if a country doesn't pay? Uh, well, I don't know that we'll find out if anyone doesn't pay. You know, that's they could try to call Trump's bluff. But look, I, I think. There's a point that there's a reason why the admiral was involved in negotiations like this, and not the president of the United States. This is not presidential business usually, but Donald Trump has made it his business. And I, I, another uh, another dimension of this, I think, is we're, we're in a generational change. There are populations of, of you know American voters and. Uh, populations in these countries that we're dealing with that don't remember the last 50 years or don't maybe appreciate the reason why American troops are stationed there to begin with. And so the controversies of places like Okinawa or Korea, mm. where, you know, local populations may have had beefs, may be changing over time. And the, the more that Donald Trump frames this as a protection racket, as, as you know, we're, we're, we're going to protect your countries, and I'm honored right. to do it, rather than it is in America's security interest that we protect these, not just these countries, but American interests in these countries, and our economic interests, and our social interests, you name it. Right. Lacey, I was amused at, at, at one point in our history that, uh, and, and Admiral Fallon may have been involved in this, I'm not sure, but in the early 1990s, in the first Gulf War, the Japanese did not participate. Then the Assistant Secretary of State, Richard Solomon, uh, made a big deal that the Japanese didn't participate in sort of in, in blood uh, and, and, and force on the line. Uh, so the Japanese wrote a check. They wrote a $13 billion check. You know, $13 billion went further than uh, at that time. And we actually made a profit. The United States made a profit uh, off of that war. And it was the first time I ever thought about running uh, the Pentagon at a profit. But how does this feel? I mean, you're, you're, you're a specialist, and you kind of talk about our American military commitments today. Does it make sense that President Trump is putting pressure on allies to contribute more. After all, the United States is less uh, of the size of the economy that it once was. It is still maintaining a global infrastructure of security. Yeah. Shouldn't these nations pay a lot more? Yeah, I can't say that I agree with uh, running the Pentagon at, at a profit. I don't think that's exactly what we want to be doing. There's, there's absolutely, I agree with Kevin, that there is, uh, it is in the U.S. interest for us to have these bases overseas. It's basic 101. We have to have uh, allies. But uh, what Trump is doing, I think, is actually turning this on its head, and he's going down a, a road that many uh, presidents, uh, many uh, lawmakers have gone down before saying, yes, we, our allies need to share more of this burden. Uh, and he is, he understands that this is a super political situation. He understands that people inside the U.S. Uh, are not going to be excited about closing any bases, whether those are overseas or, or domestic. Uh, he understands that some people, some of our allies, don't actually want our bases there. And so if he turns this on its head and he says, well, this is a protection racket, like, I'll do it if you really want me to, then it allows, and it's dangerous because it puts the, it, it puts the, the onus on our allies to say, sure, we don't want well, you here. Well, it does exactly what President, uh, Ambassador, uh, uh, Ambassador, sorry <laughs> to give you a, a different promotion, but uh, Admiral Fallon just, just <laughs> talked about, which is to drag this out in the limelight. It becomes controversial everywhere. Let's listen yeah. to President Trump talk about uh, his, his latest uh, uh, conquest. Uh, but South Korea is costing us five billion dollars a year, and they pay, they were paying about 500 million for five billion dollars worth of protection, uh, and we have to do better than that. So uh, they've agreed to pay 500 million more, and uh, over the years it'll start going up. Admiral Fallon, you know the Pacific uh, region very well. Um, the real numbers are that Korea paid about $900 million in change last year. But what is, what is the, the issue that we're really trying to, to, to drive at here? Uh, should we be asking uh, the Koreans to amp up what they're doing uh, at the level of $5 billion a year? What does that do to the integrity and solvency of that, um, 
alliance. So without getting into the details of the numbers, uh, what I believe we're seeing here, frankly, is the behavior of the president from his past life, in which it's pretty well documented that his, uh, his MO is to go in and hit him in the, in the nose with a big number or a big threat or a big something and intimidate them and then and they'll back off. But my experience, this is not the way you do international diplomacy. And particularly in but Korea. But this is South Korea, right? Partic on the, on the border of North Korea, which is threatening the region with nuclear missiles and weapons and warheads, threatening Japan. So the one that gets the bloody nose is our ally? So. Korea is a very interesting situation. Again, gets back to this point about each of these arrangements with different countries around the world and the U.S. are unique. So in Korea, the history here goes back to, I'm not going to recite uh, since uh, the Korean War in 1950, but as a result of that war, the U.N. was asked to go to the defense of Korea. After the armistice, and it's worth noting that in Korea, there is no end to the Korean War. It has not been adjudicated. It has not been settled. There's just an armistice. It's been in effect since 1953. Pretty interesting, huh? So uh, the war could start again at any time. The point is now, we're there, and we have a very um, different arrangement in Korea than in other places. The U.S. force is there, and, re and there are not that many, particularly compared to the past in the t mid 20s, probably 20,000, something like that. And most of those are uh, support people for the bases and headquarters. But in Korea, the command relationship is different than, than most places. So you have uh, what's known as a combined forces command in which U.S. and Korean leaders are totally integrated on the staff. So it's not like in most places where the U.S. will go in with a, with a staff of officers, maybe usually will be the commander, and others will bring their staffs. This is completely integrated right, from top right. to bottom. So they're very close together. And it's really, um, <laughs> if this is going to be effective, if the defense of the Korean Peninsula is necessary in the future, it has to work. So the idea that you go in and just bludgeon them and say, we want five times as much money to do this, well, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Uh, the Koreans just spent a lot of money at their behest to move us out of Yongsang, the uh, the major facility in, in to Seoul. To Camp Humphreys. To Humphreys. Okay, that actually is to our advantage because it's a lot further back from the DMZ than the previous place was. And uh, in military terms, outside the range of current North Korean artillery, significant difference. So we have these facilities in Korea. Right. They're designed to be integrated with the Koreans in case of an emergency. And I think it's, uh, it's very important that we keep these arrangements as long as we have an interest in Northeast Asia, which we certainly do. So, Kevin, uh, I, I heard everything the admiral said, but again, going back to the words of the president that you said we should questionably listen to uh, on mm -hmm. occasion, uh, as, as I shared with you earlier, we uh, watched uh, President Trump at Camp Humphreys during his first trip to Korea. It was about 3 a.m. in Washington, D.C. time. I remember it very well. Gave a speech about how important the U.S.-Korea relationship was, about the American presence in Asia. And then when he finished his speech and the teleprompter was off, he said he could have built that base far cheaper uh, than it was built for uh, and faster, and that this base was not for America's security anyway. It was only for Korea's. And so with that one line undid uh, what I think was the purpose of the trip was to demonstrate to the Koreans that America's security was also Korea's security. And I'm interested in, in whether or not we should be listening to that president of the United States or should we be listening to the command structure of the Pentagon that has been saying and arguing uh, as, as best it can differently. I think you better listen to both. I, you know, I think absolutely you, you need to listen to commanders in the Pentagon and around the world who give their, you know, advice, and they're the ones on the front line saying this is what we believe is needed to, remember, to execute the policies that they're given by the president, by the White House. You know, sometimes, right. you know, they're, they're lobbying in their own way for the kinds of, you know, forces and equipment and agreements that sure. they need. But you better listen to the president, too, because, again, he reflects a, a large percentage of the population, whether you agree with it or not, whether you think they understand the world or they're naive and they don't understand the world. A lot of people, I think, even in the in international relations circles are starting to say, you know what? They have a legitimate grievance. There's a, you know, there's a lot of people that think, yeah, most countries around the world could chip in a little bit more. It's, it, what's unique is this president, in his bull-in-a-china-shop kind of way, 
comes in and, like you said, will bloody the nose of an ally publicly in their own country to say, just to say, you know, he has a little upper hand politically uh, to make himself look tough, like the deal maker that he is. It's the New York, you know, real estate mogul language that he knows that he's bringing to something as sensitive and complex as international right. diplomacy. It, but when you ask American people or voters and the population, they're not in the weeds into all these, you know, agreements like that we know. All they hear is, look, he's fighting for us. He's doing he's doing what we asked him to do. I think there's a fundamental uh, assumption that that is uh, inherent in words like that, and that is that these deals are one way, that somehow we are benefiting all yeah. these countries by our presence. And in fact, most of these arrangements are very definitely two-way deals in which we get something out of this as well as the other country. And if you lump these all together and take the view that they're all the same and it's all the U.S., the great and powerful, mighty U.S., and we're here to take care of things and save you. That's absolutely the wrong view. Well, you see, let me ask point. you, yeah. what is the unrecognized dependency How that the mean? United States has on this global infrastructure basis that is not really being talked about much Yeah, today. I mean, we're certainly dependent. To this point, though, about uh, about certainly our, our two-way, uh, the two-way importance of this, it's very important for the U.S. to have these bases. But that also, I, I want to point out, I, I very much agree with that, but I... Uh, we can't wholesale, make the wholesale assumption that all of these agreements and all, all, of the, all of these agreements right. yeah. and, and all of these bases are necessary. And I think that's certainly, I mean, you mentioned in Sherlock, it, it, we have U.S. nuclear weapons stationed 100 miles from the border of Syria. Mm. It's, there are some of these arrangements that could use revisiting. And, you know, that I, th I think often sure. the conversation is boiled down into, oh, well, the president doesn't understand how NATO works. He doesn't. He doesn't understand that that they're not, you know, just giving us money to do this thing. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I just don't think he cares. Let me let me bring up a, a tweet from Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. It reads: Our defense budget continues to fund endless wars that damage our reputation in the world and do not make us any safer in the U.S. We need to reduce our military budget, which totals more than the next seven countries combined. This next seven countries combined is the part of this that interests me. So if you were basically trying to change the economics of how the United States uh, basically makes the economic equation for defending the world and defending its interests, um, when you begin trying to put a, increase the price tag of these smaller countries, it's still a pretty well, small deal what about what they're What difference would doing. it make to, to the level of threat that's coming from the Middle East and North Africa, from ISIS and al-Qaeda, or from Afghanistan, from the Taliban, or anywhere else in Asia? What difference would it make if those seven countries started paying more? Would it, you know, it, it may, to me, that sounds like a nice optics question, but it doesn't get to the heart of, does America think it is, it is to its interests and its, uh, you know, enduring security? to have forward deployed troops right. at these bases and have these agreements with countries to go back to the topic with, with, with President so the, Trump. So the price tag doesn't add up. It, 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 it doesn't add up. Yeah. It's, it's a, I mean, it's, you know, everyone would love to have some sort of, you know, some more equitable burden sharing in the world. But you're never, it's never going to happen because the size of the United States is just so exponentially just larger. And, every, and, and the capabilities are exponentially larger. You, Syria is the example. You could pull the United States out of Syria. Trump wanted to pull the U.S. and let, let the Europeans handle the security there. But the Brits and the the French and the others in there can't do the special ops missions without the Americans helping enable those missions. They can't do this on their own without these partnerships, and the United States can't either. So th there's some fundamentals here. Mm. Uh, does the United States wish to be engaged in the world? Yes or no? The president feels, from my interpretation of his words, no. that we ought to be doing a lot less of that and just worry about ourselves. And I would say interesting proposition, but in today's world, it's a non-starter. Just doesn't work. We're so too I interconnected, too interdependent. And the reality is the world depends on the U.S. and our leadership and our willingness to engage. And if we were to withdraw from that, I mean, it's, it, you get into a deep political well, question, but I, the I, fundamentals I, here... I don't are, think the president wants to pull out completely. I think he, no. I think he says it, but then he doesn't ever mean it, and his actions don't, don't, don't uh, back up his words. Well, we've, we've seen, we've more seen more troop increases, yeah. Anyway, we've yeah. More we've seen troop increases, increases in, in various places abroad. abroad. In but it does raise an interesting he, he question, because I'm not sure I agree with you, Kevin, and Lacey, I'm going to, uh, you know, give the floor to you for a moment to, to, to share this, because I find it very interesting. I agree with the admiral that I think President Trump uh, is less interested in being engaged internationally than even uh, President Obama was, who, you know, believed in strategic caution. In many ways, Donald Trump is far more cautious than President Obama was. 
Uh, and I think that when you look at that tweet from Ilhan Omar, what it's basically saying is we're doing too much out there. And I'm wondering if Ilhan Omar and President Trump are sort of covertly on the same piece of territory. <laughs> that was an, that's an interesting suggestion. I, I, uh, I really do think that, you know, folks like Ilhan Omar are certainly also looking yes, at our domestic situation, reasons. our domestic political situation, our spending, and they're saying we need to be spending more on health care or uh, student loans, whatever so, it might be. They're saying, you know, these things are potentially more important than all the money that we're spending that is so much more than our allies. And, hey, couldn't they be doing a little bit more? And I do. I agree with you. I think that if President Trump had his way, he would pull back some of some of our forward deployments. He would he would, he would bring us home. And uh, not entirely. I don't know. I can't speak for President Trump. But I, uh, I think some of the uh, think tanks and the groups that he's working with, uh, their perspective would, would be that we so can do more you, from in, home. In, in, in the last bit of time we have, um, ask you just, just for short snapshots, that if you were getting given the task, if you were working for this president and part of your task was to recognize that we're in an inflection point, the United States is in an inflection point after World War II, we can't maintain the same uh, level of global bases and global presence, where would you roll back? Where would you, uh, where would you roll back, and, but, but maybe where would you raise the price if you were going to keep American presence uh, to our allies? Admiral Fallon. Uh, uh, Steve, I would uh, disagree with the uh, with the premise there. I think, first of all, we've <laughs> thanks. We, we have sorry, <laughs> but uh, we have substantially reduced our overseas presence in numbers of troops. Uh, the forces, uh, particularly in the last few years, most in fact are back in the continental U.S. The challenge for us is that we uh, cannot respond or reach out to places that may become troublesome uh, without access to certain places in the world. It's just too difficult, too hard. We still so have about 200,000 really troops important. abroad, though. In, for different reasons right. in different places. Mm -hmm. And and I give you one example back to kind of where we started in, in Northeast Asia. The arrangement with Japan is a result of the end of World War II. And the, the basic deal was this. We, the U.S., will provide your security, Japan. We don't want you to have another military because we don't want a repetition of what we saw in the early 20th century. Therefore, we will protect you. In exchange for that, we need access. Right. And so we got these bases and facilities. But I would, I would throw one more thing into, the, mm. into this mix here. And this is something for the Congress. So there are a lot of criticisms, you know, the president does this, da da da. Right. Are the majority of people in this country worried we don't have a budget? We do not have a real budget in this country. The Congress has not passed one in years. What does this mean? It means we're going to waste more money in defense and other things because the law says that the way Through inertia. money yeah. has to be spent is not smartly, not with forethought and planning, but in incrementals that don't exceed whatever was done last year. So if you did something last year, you can do that. It's absurd. It's, it's called inertia. Nuts. Lacey, real nuts. quick, your thoughts on well, one. I mean, Admiral Fallon says, let's keep it all. <laughs> to the, uh, to the, to this, the budget this, point. Uh, to the budget point, yeah. I agree. It's, it's ridiculous right. that we can't pass right. the budget. But we uh, also are, have not uh, right. just passed things in incremental, uh, same as last year. We've significantly ramped up the, the military okay, budget over the last few years. So uh, I mentioned U.S. nuclear weapons before. I think that's one of the most obvious places. We've got you know nuns walking into air bases and putting stickers on on bombs. Uh, I, I think that uh, you know in some of these places uh, we could reconsider uh, whether or not we would even use those B61s. Kevin, where would you roll back or where would you charge a higher price for the Pentagon's love? Uh, I, I, I'm going to agree with Admiral Fallon to disagree with the premise of your question, but instead say, look, go back to that Elon Omar tweet. But yeah. the first part of it, when she mentions forever wars, look, you have the president is more closely aligned with a rising Democratic left who believes that there are too many wars and there's too much American military power overseas and it's costing too much money. And the middle, which a lot of people think is the sensible national security you know, expert middle, is getting shrunken out of the debate more and more every time President Trump goes out there and makes these kind of speeches that under cuts his own policy about why the United States needs to have or wants to have troops abroad able to defend America's security interests, economic interests, the voters' interests. And as long as the voters hear that message, they don't get the policy and you're not going to have the support ever. And this is all Is Korea forever war? 
Is Korea a forever? Good question. I, you know, let's ask uh, the Democratic candidates. I'd like to hear what Elizabeth Warren says. This is a wonderful conversation. With thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank our panel to, uh, for being with us today: Lacey Healy, Chief Editor of Inkstick; Kevin Barron, Executive Editor of Defense One; and Admiral William Fallon, former Commander of U.S. Central Command and Pacific Command. Very cool discussion. Thank you so much for joining us today. So what's the bottom line? A wise man once said, nothing says I love you like a shakedown. The Trump administration is demanding South Korea pay billions more to keep U.S. troops in their country. Japan is next. And it's all part of a plan Donald Trump laid out during his campaign when he promised to force America's allies to pay for American protection. My guests have more confidence than I do that this will blow over, that American security is woven in tightly to the security of our allies. But to me, this sounds like an American force becoming a mercenary operation. Alliances a la carte. You get it if you pay for it. And that's the bottom line. Thank you.